You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, welcome to Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, the preacher of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. I'm happy to be the moderator of this program that's overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee and presented to you with the financial support of 57 Churches of Christ all throughout this region. Without them, this program would not be possible. We are appreciative to them and we encourage you to go and visit and worship with them whenever you might have the opportunity. You'll see their names at the end of our program today. We have three gospel preachers and they've done an outstanding job all this month in answering your questions. We've been delighted to have them. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, my name is Mike Hickson. I preach for the Olive Branch Church of Christ. We are located in Olive Branch, Mississippi. So grateful to have the opportunity to be a part of the program today. Hi, I'm John DeBerry, Jr. I'm the minister of the Coleman Avenue Church of Christ. I have some wonderful people there, wonderful elders, deacons, and members striving to serve the Lord. And we thank the Lord that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, be with you today. Hello, my name is Jared Rhodes. I'm one of the ministers at the Olive Branch Church of Christ, and I am blessed and honored to have the opportunity to sit down and to dig into God's Word with you today. I mentioned last week that back in August of this year, I had the privilege of being in Farmington, Missouri with the Sunnyview Church of Christ and being with those good brethren there for their annual lectureship. I not only spoke, but participated in an open forum, and we had a number of questions with which we dealt, many of those dealing with the book of Jeremiah, and uh, these were questions that were submitted from people who were present that day. So we thought uh, we would share them with you, that we might all benefit from uh, answers to these questions. Our first question goes to Brother DeBerry. How can the book of Jeremiah be inspired, the person says, if the original manuscript was destroyed. Brother DeBerry. We all know and understand what has been said and, and probably can, once I start the scripture, you can, you can finish the quote that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That being said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, what are we to understand from that? We're to understand that the Word of God is God-breathed. It is God-inspired. That when we read and study the Bible, that's God talking to us. When we pray, that's us responding to what God has said. So what about the book of Jeremiah? The book of Jeremiah is no different from the entire volume. Because of the degenerate nature of of man today, because we have gone down the moral elevator, because we want to remove all standards, because we want to live as we choose to live, as it was said in the people about the people uh, in the days uh, ending the judges. In that time, there was no king in the land, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. The Bible is a standard, and because of the Scripture inspired by God. God has given us a moral code. He has given us a standard, uh, a, a group of principles that make us what we ought to be and who God intends for us to be as his image. So what about the book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, this man that, Jer that God said to him in the book of Jeremiah chapter 1 and verses 5, before I form thee in the womb, I knew thee. So God chose him for this prophetic responsibility, and God placed him uh, in that position at a time when Judah, it, their destruction is imminent, somewhere between 598 and 586 B.C. This man's prophetic voice is speaking to the people. Some folks say, well, that may, that, that's not verifiable, that the original uh, tablets and scrolls and leather scrolls have been destroyed. Well, the fact is that Jeremiah is well represented both in the Greek 
and in the Hebrew. And with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls verifies that the book of Jeremiah is an inspired volume. Here's the thing about the skeptics, the atheists, the agnostics, those individuals who are trying to destroy the validity of God's word. Every time they seek to prove that God's word is untrue, they end up proving that it is. Every time they dig and sniff around in the dirt trying to prove that a city didn't exist, that a historical happening didn't exist, that a person didn't exist, guess what? They end up proving that it actually did. And it's the same way uh, with the book of Jeremiah. Not only do we have historical evidence that the book of Jeremiah is inspired, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus, who is the verification of the prophets, the verification of the plan, and the fulfillment of all righteousness, as he said to John the Baptist, when John says, I don't need to baptize you, I'm not worthy to tie your sandals, Jesus says, we must fulfill all righteousness. Jesus quoted Jeremiah. In Mark chapter 8 and verses 18, Jesus quoted Jeremiah chapter 5 and verses 21. In Mark chapter 11 and verses 17, and Luke chapter 19 and verses 46, Jesus quoted Jeremiah chapter 7 and verses 11. By virtue of the Son of God speaking of Jeremiah and speaking of his prophecy and his writing, we know that Jeremiah, regardless of what the skeptics say, regardless of what those who refuse to believe say, that this is the word of God of God. So therefore, one thing we can know is that <clears throat> regardless of what we don't have as historical documents that will appease those who are skeptic, we have the Word of God in comparison to Ezekiel, to Daniel, and others. Jeremiah fits right in and is historically accurate. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. You know, um, existing manuscript copies of the original are inspired as long as they have accurately reproduced the original manuscript. And I think about the fact that if we still had the originals, what we call the autographs, you know what people would do? There's some people that would make idols of them. You just look uh, at what they did with the brazen serpent. They took it and they made an idol of it and they called it Nehushtan. And they would do the same thing if the autographs were still around. Brother Rhodes, can you describe the captivity in Babylon? In Jeremiah 29, 5 and 6, they were told to build houses and increase their families, Brother Rhodes. You know, I think that's an excellent question. As you go back to Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, there are some things that I think we can bring in, especially in verse 4. He says, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives. You know, first off, I see this picture of war in my head. You understand that it's not a time of peace and prosperity and everything's going well, but rather when he talks about captivity, I think of a time of turmoil. You know, if your house is on fire, you don't say, I need to get all my special keepsakes out and I'll give my life for it. You might say that about your children. I'll give my life for my children. I want to make sure they come out of the house. But you understand when the house is on fire that your life is the most important thing you have. When you talk about a moment of captivity, as they come in and they're taking these people captive, the word when in and of itself demonstrates or resonates the idea of it's not your choice anymore. You don't get to decide what to do. You're going with me. We don't see the idea of a U-Haul gets backed up to the house, grab everything you want and bring it with you, but rather they're captive. And so you go down into verse 5, it says, build ye, build ye houses and dwell in them. 
You know, I can't help but think of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, where Paul speaking there, he says, And I have learned whatsoever state I am in, therein to be content. Now, I'm not saying state like Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, but wherever he was in life, he had to choose to be satisfied where he was and do his best to serve God then. You know, as you go to um, captivity, they get carried away. God didn't say, all right, if you're going to do it right, you've got to figure out the quickest way to get out of here and get back to where you're from because this isn't home. But rather, in verse 5 and 6, he says, make yourself at home. Start living for the Lord. Do the best that you can right where you are. You get down into verse 6, he says, take you wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. He said, this isn't where the, story's in, the story ends. It's not over for my people. The sons of God will still fulfill God's design in bringing forth the Christ. Just because you're in captivity doesn't mean that God's plan's destroyed. And so therefore, he says, go on. Let's relate it to today. No matter where you are, no matter where you live, you have the opportunity to be a bright light in the community in which we live so that others can glorify and come to know God and share in the joy of salvation that we have received because God gave His Son for us and for them. You know, I think of Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. When Noah gets off the ark, God didn't say, you know what? Life's been really good, and I'm so glad you guys are faithful. Just go ahead and lay out here the rest of your days until you die, and we'll all go to heaven, and it'll be over. But rather, in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1, he says, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Why? Because God has a plan. And so, therefore, we've got to trust the plan. We've got to do, by God's design, whatever, wherever we find ourselves there at that moment, we're going to do our best to live for God. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are the household of faith. Thank you so much for that question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, Be Baptized. If you'd like to have this tract or the first lesson of our eight-lesson Bible correspondence course, or both, or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by our website at www.abibleanswertv.org. You can also reach our YouTube channel by looking for www.abibleanswertv. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel today. You can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net or you can call your, our toll-free number with your request. That number is 1-800-436-0463. Back to our questions today to Brother Mike Hickson. Please discuss Jeremiah 31, about the meaning of a woman shall encompass a man. Brother Hickson. Thank you, Mike. The book of Jeremiah is one of the great books in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, as you know, began his prophecy on the eve of Babylonian destruction. Jared was talking just a moment ago about their captivity. And the people of God had, according to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, they had forsaken him. In verse 32, as incredible as it might have seemed, they, forgotten, they forgot him. Jeremiah said, days without number. And so Jeremiah was pleading with God's people to come back. And ultimately, they were to go into 70 years of captivity. And they would, go, they would go to Babylon. In the book of Jeremiah in chapter 31, while there is no doubt emphasis placed upon the new covenant, that is that new dispensation that would be established by the death of Jesus on Calvary. In chapter 31, Jeremiah pictures the time when God's people would be allowed to return to their homeland from captivity. One of the great passages in chapter 31 at verse 3, a reminder of God's love for the human family. God said of Israel of old, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. 
Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Down in verse 8, to those by way of assurance and hope, comfort. God said through the prophet, Behold, I will bring them from the north country, an allusion here to Babylon, and gather them from the coast of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. And then, of course, in verse 9, he said, They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. Look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations. Declare it in the isles afar off. And say, He that scattered Israel will gather them, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Again, pointing to Babylonian captivity. Down in verse 16, the record says, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And so, words of hope and comfort. And then to our text, verse 22. Jeremiah asked, How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth, a woman shall encompass a man. I would suspect that there are some who would see in this verse a picture of the coming of the Christ, that being the virgin birth. Now typically we go back and we look at the Old Testament, I think about in Hebrews chapter 10, where the writer there talks about those types and shadows. And there were types and a corresponding antitype. Back in Exodus chapter 12, you remember God instituted the Passover. The correlation to that, of course, would be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 7, where Paul said, For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. In Isaiah 7 verse 14, Isaiah pointed to that day and time in which the Lord would be born of a virgin. And Matthew documents that in Matthew chapter 1. You remember that which was conceived in Mary was of the Holy Spirit. And the angel said to Joseph that she would bring forth a son, his name would be called Jesus, and he would save his people from their sins. But then he goes on to say, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated, God with us. And so there we have the type and the antitype, that shadow and then its fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1. I know that there are some that would see in Jeremiah chapter 31 an allusion to the virgin birth, but I don't think we can be dogmatic because, quite frankly, the Bible just doesn't say. There are overtones or there is emphasis on this new covenant in which the Lord would forgive their iniquities and their sins. He said, I will remember no more. But in terms of that verse, I just quite honestly, can't say conclusively that it's talking about the coming of the Messiah. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you very much. Now to Brother DeBerry. Could you please speak about Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17, and later in Matthew 2, 18, about Rachel weeping for her children? Brother DeBerry. Well, when we, we talk about uh, some of the prophecies and the fulfillment of those prophecies in the New Testament, as Mike said a moment ago, we have to look at the typical and antitypical nature of some verses, some that are the shadow and then the fulfillment uh, of the shadow. We know that in order for God to create redemptive religion, He had to create spiritual nomenclature. He had to create a bloodline. And, and there are many types and symbols. Rachel, who is the wife of Jacob. We know that Jacob loved Rachel with all of his heart. He, he worked seven years as a deal uh, with his father-in-law uh, Laban, and he gave him Leah who was the eldest daughter, which is the traditional way things were done. The eldest daughter was married first, but he kind of tricked him. He thought he was uh, lying with Rachel, but instead uh, he was in Leah, with Leah. But then there's a little bit of poetic justice there 
since Jacob's name, his very name, surplanter, heel catcher, uh, he was always one of those slick individuals who kind of slicked his brother out of his uh, birthright, and he kind of got a taste of his own medicine. But he still worked another seven years so that Rachel could be his wife. Rachel bore him two sons. Leah bore him six sons. Belha bore him two sons. A concubine, Zelpah, uh, bore him also two sons. So he has those 12 sons that are to become the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Rachel is used here by Jeremiah in the verse, he says in verses um, uh, 15, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations, a bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Of course, Ramah is about five miles from Jerusalem and was probably the staging place for the Israelites to go into captivity uh, from, from that city. So this is a terrible thing to see. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet, and poetically he uses Rachel as the mother of all 12, even though she was only the mother of two. She, he uses her name as the mother of the sons of Jacob, uh, excuse me, typically because of what's getting ready to happen to them. When we go over to the book of Matthew, we know that we have Herod who is trying to destroy the Messiah before he is born. He is trying to take the life of Jesus Christ, uh, our Savior. And then was fulfilled. Notice that word uh, in Matthew chapter 2 and verses 17. Fulfilled. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentations. Basically here, now it's the fulfillment of the type because Herod has killed the firstborn. He is trying to find, not the firstborn, but the young children in an attempt to kill uh, the Messiah uh, at his birth. So what is meant by this? You have the weeping of Babylonian captivity and the blood that is shed, the fulfillment, the weeping at the birth of Christ and the blood being shed uh, of, the ch of the children. You connect the two and you, you see why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he is weeping over the suffering of his people. But mind this, uh, that they were suffering not because God had forsaken them or God's arms were short. They were suffering because of sin, because of sin. They had rejected God and God had removed his hands, so to speak, and God who fought for them, now their enemy is taking them staged at Ramah and there is lamentation because of the people of God leaving their land, going to a foreign land. Thank you very much. And now to Brother Rhodes. Was the Hilkiah mentioned in Jeremiah, that same man that found the book of the law? Brother Rhodes. Excellent question. As you begin in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, we see that Jeremiah comes on the scene, it says, in the 13th year of Josiah of his reign. Now, as you go back through and we talk about uh, Hilkiah, Hilkiah in and of itself means Yahweh is my portion, a fitting name for a, for a high priest. You go back to 2 Kings. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 22, it says in verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. So Jeremiah comes on the scene in Jeremiah chapter 1 where it is 13 years down the road since Josiah comes on the scene. You skip forward to verse 4. It says, go to Hilkiah the high priest. One thing you might recognize is Hilkiah here is recognized as the high priest. Therefore, he's in the right family. All right. In verse 1, it's the beginning, at, beginning of Josiah's... Uh, it's the beginning of Josiah's reign. He's in the right timeline. All right, you go down into verse 4. It says, He is the high priest, which is brought into the house of the Lord, which is the keepers of the doors have gathered of the people. Now you drop down into verse 8, and we recognize that Hilkiah 
finds the book of the law. It says in verse 8, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Now, no doubt, Jeremiah being around this as, as uh, Hilkiah the high priest, he would have absolutely been around him within that of being, being within the right tribe of Levi. It would have been important and special that Hilkiah had, had found this information. Now you drop down into verse 8. He gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. They're trying, to, uh, they're trying to get things right. You drop down to chapter 23 and verse 4 and there's a, there's a cleansing, so to speak, of the temple. It says, Then the king commanded Hilkiah, let's talk about Josiah, the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. So within this, we see the cleansing of the temple. And within that, there ought to be pride. There ought to be something to be thankful for. We're trying to get right with what the book of the Lord, the law of the Lord says. And so therefore, you go back to the question, is Jeremiah the descendant of Hilkiah. I think Hilkiah was in the right place. He was of the right family. And uh, it just so happens that at the right time, the numbers line up. Now, does it have to be the case? I'm not resting my soul on it, but I do think it is uh, possible. And in fact, I'd say it's very likely. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you to each of these brethren for doing such a great job all this month in answering your questions. You know, it's hard to believe that Thanksgiving Day has passed. What did you reach for for Thanksgiving? Maybe you reached for that turkey leg or some more dressing or sweet potatoes or a piece of pumpkin pie or a camera to take a family picture. What did you reach for at Thanksgiving? You know, between the shortest Psalm, Psalm 117, in the longest psalm, Psalm 119, is a very special psalm of thanksgiving, which shouldn't be overlooked, Psalm 118. We call it an envelope psalm because it begins and ends with the same thought, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, because His mercy endureth forever. I want to encourage you to reach back and recall God's goodness to you. And then reach up and recite God's gratitude, your gratitude to God for what He's done for you. And then reach out in your life and reflect God's generosity. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.